One, two. In the still of the night. All right, we're sitting here with Wes Sharon, a producer, a Grammy nominated producer now. That's John Fulbright's uh, From the Ground Up. But I'm always interested in uh, you know, people's musical past, and yours was uh, pretty rambunctious from what I understand. You were in a band called Angry Sun, and, and it was a little more, a little, you know, a little more rough around the edges than some of the singer-songwriter stuff you're producing now. It was a punk band for sure. It was just a yeah. punk band, okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, I had a colorful past. Yes. I didn't assume. <laughs> yeah. How did the Angry Sun come together? I joined that band late. Like I was late, I was late to the party, kind of. They had, they, they were friends of mine. But certainly, the singer was from high school, and they had gotten a record deal. Mm -hmm. And they said, I guess the record label told them they needed a better bass player and a better drummer. And, and been, you played bass. And I played bass at the yeah. time, or still do. And uh, they, they knew that the band I had been in, Shoe Pop Up Blue, had broken up. So they came to me and they said, "Do you want to play?" And uh, I said, sure, you know, and I got a drummer, so we we kind of joined the band and did some demos, and um, it went on from there. Yeah, you, know? you guys know. started off. Uh, what kind of stuff did you guys cover back then? Like, uh, well, what did you learn learn with? The, well, that that band didn't cover anything. You know, when I was growing up, the kind of stuff that I'd play. Um, we had talked, you know, earlier we had talked about punk bands and yeah. them not playing you know the thing about us was we had all I guess to learn your instrument you, you know you have to start somewhere so a lot of the songs that I was learning and certainly like the drummers in the area we were you know drummers love Rush you know and oh, stuff like that yeah, you know yeah. so the drummers that were joining these punk bands they had all played Rush songs and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that and like I was into Iron Maiden and you know, Black Flag and, you know, where people could actually kind of play, you mm -hmm. know. So by the time you joined a punk band in Oklahoma, I don't know if it's like that everywhere, you were a player, you know. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could play pretty well, you right. know, no matter, it might be sloppy, but you knew what you, you knew where you were headed, you know. Yeah. Man, by the time I was in a band like Angry Sun, we went on tour and I was real, we were all pretty afraid of playing with California bands. You know, because we played in Texas a lot, and we knew that they were good bands and stuff. But uh, we got out to California, and it was really apparent that we were quite a bit better <laughs> right. than the California bands. Um, just better players, you know. Right. And we also we also play. By the time we were playing in California, we had already been on tour for a little while, and the the show just kept getting tighter and tighter. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. so, you, so you guys did a lot of. Uh, so you guys went out there, and that was about the time bands like uh, Green Day were kind of really young in, in California. That was kind of the sound then, huh? But, but uh, actually, we we played at Gilman Street. Our very last show was at Gilman Street, and uh, we had quite a few shows left in the tour. Right. And we were, the first night, it, it gets kind of hazy, but I know that we played with like Bikini Kill and Nation of Ulysses, and then the Green Day guys were there, and we they offered us to play to stay yeah. and uh, that band we actually uh, tried to kill each other in Green Day's house and this has been uh, building up maybe through the tour it was a money thing I think oh yeah again I came in late to the party so like right. I guess the label had sent an advance and there was some money missing or something and oh, it was okay. he shit you know she said etc yeah 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 and uh, that evening got pretty crazy um, and so we left we left our singer in San Francisco. And that was it? Yeah. And then... Uh, you ran into Billy Joe from Green Day later? Um, a friend of mine, the yeah. guy that was with us was Aaron Preston from the Chainsaw Kittens, and he later joined For Love Not Lisa, and he was at Tipitina's. And, yeah. Uh, it was a big melee. It's hard to describe. It was probably 50 punk rock kids trying to pull four of us apart, you know? Woo. And so, uh, lots of screaming, you know? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure it was like punching and stuff too. But when Billy Joe saw Aaron, he just, he was like, hey man, you look really familiar. You know? Yeah. 
So he had to kind of demure. And yeah. I think it came out. I think they finally figured out, you know, who who was what. But, yeah, that story People haunts us to this day. <laughs> came back and, and played with some of the same guys in Oklahoma. Uh, uh, Oklahoma had a pretty vibrant punk scene back in the day, right? Late it, 80s, it early was. 90s. And everybody was really different. There wasn't a whole lot that was the same, you know. It was real right. inclusive, you know. Yeah. I think I think the bands were kind of out for number one most of the time, you know. But you would have bands like anything that I was trying to do, and then, you know, you had bigger bands. You, mm -hmm. know? you, you always had, like... Obviously, the Flaming Lips were a huge deal, you know, but they just weren't a big deal here. You know, yeah. on tour, I started to notice that, that like we'd go to these record stores and everywhere we went, there'd be like a little shrine in the record store to the Flaming Lips, you know? Yeah. It was yeah. real weird. And then here, you know, they'd play at the Blue Note or whatever, you know? It was real strange. That is weird. But. There was a lot of interest in, I, I guess in the early 90s, there was a lot of interest in Oklahoma. It was actually an entertainment weekly. As like, whereas this is post, like, the Nirvana Seattle thing, and it's like, they were guessing where the next scene was going to come from. And that's what they said. And it was Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or South Carolina, or whatever. Right. And uh, um, they said Oklahoma City or Norman, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But, anyway. Well, so as one gets older, you start to see more... Uh, the, the bigger picture, and now you, you kind of have your own studio, and you, you're you kind of a behind-the-scenes man now. When, is that just a natural evolution? How did that come about? You, it was for me, I, I started, actually, I was being asked to produce bands before I was an engineer. Okay. So, when the, through a series of events, I, I, 
I actually became a rafting guide for a summer. I thought that would be a great thing to do. <laughs> um, I ended up uh, deciding to go to a recording school while I was a rafting guide because I knew that I wasn't going to, you can't do that. I mean, you can do it during the summer, but, you know, most of those guys are committed to it and they ski tech. They, they ski during the winter. They, yeah. they ski tech in the winter and they raft in the summer and yeah. they have three months off between each of those gigs and it's, mm -hmm. it's a hard way to live, you know, so... Uh, I, I decided to go to a recording school and I did that. And what I learned there, I didn't actually learn much at the recording school, but uh, I did graduate at the top of my class, you know. Yeah. And so I decided that, that part of that is you have to do an internship. And so I, I was a big Tom Waits fan and I knew that he had recorded at this place called Prairie Sun Recording. And I, yeah. I had, I really did think he owned that place. And so. I got an internship there, mm -hmm. and I learned more my first day at Prairie Sun than I had in six months of <laughs> this school that I'd gone to. Right. And uh, it was really rough, you know. It, you had to. It was different than I was. I had been in studios before, but it was a different way of looking at them. Well, his album yeah. sounds so weird. I mean, he always has these <laughs> like like natural metallic elements in them. I don't I don't know what he does. They don't use a lot of you know, outboard gear to get reverb and stuff. Like, their delays, at that time when I worked there, it was all tape anyway, but they were using tape delays, they were using real rooms for reverbs. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a reverb in a box, it was an actual plate reverb, you know? Uh -huh. so a thing the size of a bathtub with a metal plate in the middle and it oh, okay. shakes to create a oh. reverb sound. Oh, okay. So it's got all that eerie stuff that you hear and all mm -hmm. that spooky, roomy sound. That's the real deal. And when you stand in those rooms, it, it's an odd phenomenon. You can place that sound on that record immediately. Like, right. You know you're in the weights room when you're in the weights room. It just has this sound. It's this chicken hatchery that he chose to use. And it wasn't actually part of the studio at that time. Oh, wow. But that's where I learned how to record. And it became... Northern California is really expensive, so I decided I would come back, mm -hmm. and I built my first place in a house, mm -hmm. and uh, I would still fly out to California and work when I had budgets for it. Yep. But I've just kind of pursued it ever since. Yeah. And, and now I, uh, I have a place called 115 Recording in Norman. Right, right. And uh, it's a great place. I was, I was fortunate to be able to have that space, and I was actually hired to put it together for a guy and then he was the owner and he asked me to work for him and he decided to sell it and I decided to buy it from him oh, and, wow. and did what I had to do to get the money together you know mm -hmm. so but I was able to build the place I would have wanted to own and otherwise I would have never had a place like that you know yeah, it was a yeah. really good opportunity so well, this 115 is uh, going to have a lot more uh, name recognition now. Uh, I guess in February you're going to be flying out to uh, California, right? Yeah. You're going to go to this? I am, yeah. This, uh, this is uh, From the Ground Up, the John Fulbright. Uh, I mean, the first proper John Fulbright record. There was a live record, but this is the one that... Uh, this is the one that's kind of put uh, Fulbright on the map, the Beard in Oklahoma native. And these songs had existed for a long time. And... Uh, they had. And some of them are new, but, uh, you know, so you were a fan of the songs when he came to you anyway. I was. You know, I'd heard the record, you know, his live thing, and uh, I'd seen him play at a... I, I saw him play at a place in Norman upstairs, and it was this little tiny place. It was literally like three or four people, right? and they weren't really paying a whole lot of attention to him, you know. But I was really blown away, and uh, I was actually really impressed with how he did covers. Yeah, and I don't remember what covers he played, but he did play like a Steve Earle thing, and I remember mm -hmm. thinking that sounds like something that guy wrote, you know. So yeah, he was always yeah. kind of makes it his own. It's know? it's a, it's a weird thing to watch him own a song like he does, and uh, we became friendly, and he wanted to come in and check the studio out, and uh, I think he thought he was going to make a demo. Yeah. And uh, I just kind of, I would work, I was working on a record and we kind of borrowed some of that setup. And so he was able to walk in and play. And I actually played bass on the record. And we had a friend of ours that is still playing with John, a guy named Nuge, and then Terry Ware. Yep. And we all played those songs live. And uh, that first batch of songs, 
but we all knew it was a record, you know. Got it. And uh, so yeah, now I'm a Grammy nominated producer <laughs> and engineer and bass player for that matter, I guess. Yeah, you guys are. Uh, aren't you up against like a, a Rick Rubin produced record in this? Yeah. Like the the producer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, hmm. Yeah, what we figured out was our record cost about ten grand, and the next record up is like, you know, a hundred grand. And then, I'm, I think I've heard that the Avett Brothers record's like a million dollar record, so <laughs> where it's pretty tough, like uh, tough competition. But yeah, it's the Avett Brothers is a Rick Rubin production. Yeah, which is interesting because apparently they record everything and then they send it to him, and he tells him if he likes it. And that's his production style? I don't know yeah. if you knew that. Well, he's kind of a, a listener. I mean, he's not really like... I don't, I don't know, know that he plays an instrument. I guess he, I've heard he played guitar, I think, is what I'd heard. Yeah. I yeah, think... he just kind of listens and says, I like it or I don't. So he, producers really have such disparate methods like that, I guess. Yeah, I'm way more hands-on. <laughs> um, and that's one of the only reasons I play bass on sessions is so I can be a part of the song and kind of figure it out. It helps you own it a little bit. It seems like it helps me, you know. I've done it not doing it and I think it works out just as well. Mm -hmm. you know? But in this particular case, we needed a bass player and mm -hmm. I had one, so. Okay. Is there any other thing that would make uh, this record a, a little different uh, than something you may have worked on before or something that's, that's out in the in the mainstream now? The one thing that is different about this record is how it was made. It's so live. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's a, quite a few piano tracks on it. And we had done so much live stuff that at the very end we decided to do like more, a more traditional recording approach. And we did, we cut God Above and Daydreamer. Mm -hmm. And we had also had all these rules for ourselves. Like we don't, we didn't have to use Autotune. There wasn't any reason to. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really have to move things around a whole bunch, you know. There wasn't any of that. It was more like a '70s style right. of actually getting the take and all the way through. Yeah, and mm -hmm. when we did the piano takes, it was literally like if he made a mistake, we'd start over from the beginning, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it's it's his live vocals. I mean, with one exception, and that's that's Daydreamer obviously is like these heavily stacked vocals you know right and I think it, we had designed that song to be the very last thing you heard on the record mm -hmm. and then once all the songs were you know mixed it just worked better to like go out with something quieter you know yeah sure but um, yeah. I don't know that we'll ever do a record like that again you mm -hmm. know but <laughs> hey, buddy. And, yeah, April disagrees. <laughs> oh, yeah. April's a... Well, we'll do a little more for her. <laughs> and so I'm going to play a sample from that Daydreamer record where sure. you looped his vocals to sound like... Uh, I think that's... I mean, it sounded to me like, oh, that's a that's a cool production thing. Yeah, it's our Brian... It's our, our uh, little homage to Brian Wilson. Okay, yeah. so uh, this is uh, John Fulbright's Daydreamer as produced by Wes Sharon. One and only. Daydreamer lost in dreams Sewn all together with the magic seams Daydreamer lost in a crowd all alone Daydreamer thinks he can fly Sees white pictures in a big blue sky Daydreamer dreaming of a world all his own Young men spend a lot of time looking down at the ground looking down when they pray looking down
make mistakes But when the young man falls Well, then the old heart breaks There's a fire burning deep inside And it's mad as it's mean Well, it's hungry as it's lean And it's as fleeting as a dream sample there. I love that song. I still love that song. It gives me chills every time I hear his voice. So, still? Yeah. It's, it was an odd thing to watch because we did it so quickly. Yeah. And he'd just lay a vocal in and then it'd be like, okay, let's do thirds and then let's do fifths or whatever, you know. And then he, It was crazy how fast it went. But I don't think he was aware that he could sing like that. Really? But yeah. He was He was real impressed with himself that day. <laughs> it was, it's true. And he should have been. You know, yeah, so. the, the, the place was able to facilitate this discovery. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and I think that, that was the best part about our relationship is we figured out the... We were both kind of confident in ourselves, but we found somebody else that we could... That was equally confident without being a total jerk about it, you know. Right. And uh, it was just kind of like... You know, now he can do this, and now he can do this. You know, it's like, you know, and anything he came up with, you know, I could certainly do, you know. So it just worked out really well. It was a, you know, there's a reason why that record is as good as it is, you know. Right. It's just a really good working relationship. Yeah, it, it sounds like great chemistry. A lot of fun, you know. It's a lot of fun to make that record. So. Well, what, congratulations. I think it's just one of the best things I've Thanks. heard ever in the history of of life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Not to exaggerate. But I've heard people around this place say that, actually. Really? So, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. one of my favorite records. And yeah. so it's it's going to go down. And, uh, okay, so we're going to hear from Parker Millsap here in the, in the studio. You're, yeah. you're working on something from him? Now, yeah, also? yeah. I did his first record yeah. and uh, with him and Mike. In fact, I've recorded them before that mm -hmm. one um, a few years ago. But uh, And then we start work on their their second proper record mm -hmm. um, in about a week. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really neat. I think it's going to be a slightly bigger production. Yeah, it was a, that was, well, the first one was small. Like, you know. Yeah, they cut it really fast. It was. Um, we're all really proud of the fact that it was recorded in 17 hours. So, <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those Led Zeppelin stories, you know, they came in in two nights and yeah. knocked out Led Zeppelin one. Um, but uh, there's a slightly bigger budget for this one. All right, and they'll have drums and mm -hmm. stuff, you know. So, and I've I've heard the batch of songs, and they're really, really, really good. So, nice. I'm excited. 
All right. No rest for the weary. No. All right. Now, this is my my time off is doing this. So I really, this has been nice. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on, Wes Sharon. It's a pleasure. Any sight from sore eyes And the bells distant tolling Only keeps my mind open To the half-truths that are always half-lie Well, it might be the sound of a shell I once found or some kind of tumbling down wall. All right, we got Kazette Coverboy and musician Parker Millsap with us. Uh, is that the face you always make when you play the guitar? Mostly when I'm playing chord instruments, though. Oh, just a little tiny instrument. Yeah, chord just instruments. little chord instruments. That's the face. Well, Parker, I thought this was a real interesting article, man. Uh, you talked about how you've, uh, you're still so young, but you've already gone through like two or three different uh, styles. As yeah. As, uh, you tried the blues and you tried a country, pop country, but now yeah. it seems like you found some boys you're comfortable playing with. And, yeah. Uh, sound you like. What's, who'd you bring with us? Oh, this is Mike Rose. Uh, Mike and I started playing together in, uh, I think he was a sophomore. I was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I started playing when I was nine, so that's that's why I've had time to go through all the different styles of music. It's because when you start young enough, you, you know, have enough time to deal with all that and get all that out of the way. But um, me and Mike started playing together in blues bands in, in high school, and then uh, then he got tired of drummers, and uh, so <laughs> he eventually got an upright bass. And um, this when I graduated, um, he bought an upright bass. I think the month that I graduated high school. And then I left for three months, and when I came back, he had learned how to play it. And uh, he played electric bass for a while, but in, in about three months, he got that thing down. And then from there, we just started running, and that was last October when I got back. So, And then uh, we play every Tuesday at the Deli down in Norman, and uh, one day, our friend John Calvin, I'm sure you know John, uh, came in with Dan and said, hey, can we sit down a few songs? And there was like four people there. and. Well, why not? So, and then Dan's been playing with us ever since then. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. So I, th I think we still have a lot of that blues thing, but it's I don't know, not so electric now. All right. Well, t uh, tell us a little bit about what we're about to hear from you guys. Uh, I think we're gonna do three new songs. Um, this first one's called Yosemite, and it's a uh, a song. And then the next one's called Forgive Me, and it's uh, kind of a 60s soul kind of thing. It's got that that feel, and then the last one's going to be a blues song that I wrote recently. So okay, can't wait to hear it. All right, let's take it away. All right.
but for now I'm just here but for now I'm just here Just as hard as I 
assumption that the devil actually lives in Oklahoma. Yes. She's done her. Oh yeah, this kind of okay. What is this song? Yeah. Okay. You gotta remember to start fast enough. Is that we always start it slow and then speed way up. So uh, is it recording? Okay, right. here we go. Ready to go? Alright, uh All right. Parker Mills hat musical guest. Take two. Ha <laughs> ha